Well, heaven's going to be wonderful, isn't it? You know, a church is a little taste of heaven. As wonderful as a church is, it can't compare to what heaven's going to be like, but it's a beautiful taste of it. And to be a part of the family of God, what a thrill it is. And just to be with God's people on this Lord's Day. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to preach to you. I want you to take the Word of God with me today and open it to the book of Acts, chapter number 9. Acts chapter 9 is a well-known passage. It is the account of the conversion of Saul, who became the great apostle Paul. What a mighty preacher he became. But may I remind you that even mighty preachers begin as mighty sinners. We're all just sinners saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's changed our hearts and he's changed our eternal destinies. And though Acts 9 is known for the story of Saul's conversion, that is not what I want to preach to you about today. As a matter of fact, I want to bring you to an unusual subject in a familiar chapter. It is the passage that follows the conversion of Saul that I draw to your attention today. I think it's wonderful how there's so many little nuggets in Scripture. And we go back to it like a deep well again and again and God shows us things. And I've been reading and thinking and praying about this particular Bible character. I think... One of the great ways to study the Bible is to study the Bible by its great characters. They're all chosen by the Holy Spirit for a reason. There's something you can learn from them. Sometimes it's what to do. Sometimes it's what not to do. In this particular instance, this is one of, I think, the great unsung heroes of the New Testament church. And while all eyes seem to be on the great apostle, here is a man that we know very little about, but God used him in Paul's life in an amazing way. We pick up our reading in Acts chapter 9, verse number 10, where the Bible says, There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And the scene in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Now the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus is unique. It's unique because... Very few people have actually seen the risen Christ. He's one of them. It's unique because the way most people get saved, everybody gets saved the same way by putting their faith in Christ, but the events that surround that conversion, very few people can say, well, I was traveling along a road and all of a sudden I saw a light from heaven that blinded me and I heard the voice of God and I met Jesus in that particular way. And sometimes... We have this tendency to say, well, Saul got saved and there was no human instrument. There was, there was no human influence. It was just him and the Lord. But I want to say to you that when people's lives are changed, there are always human instruments. You see, this is the way God designed it. God uses people to minister to other people. God used men in this congregation to encourage our brother. God used a pastor this day to prompt something in a church family that was an encouragement to people. God uses people. The amazing truth of this is that God does not always use the people you think he's going to use. 
As a matter of fact, the Lord has a way of choosing people that almost seem unlikely, that, that live in unexpected places and at unexpected junctures in history. And by divine appointment, the Lord puts people together. And God does things according to his own will so that he gets the glory for it. There are certain Bible characters that stand out. They leave a big wake in their path. They come on the scene and they're so big even in our minds, in our eyes. For example, we could talk all day about the Apostle Paul. All the mighty things God used him to do. We could talk about the churches that he started and, and all the miracles he performed and thousands being converted under the gospel preaching. And somebody would say, oh, what a, what a man that was used of God. But I want to remind you that while there are people who take lead roles, they're also supporting characters. I'm speaking this morning on supporting characters in the divine drama. You see, that book, would you hold your Bible up just a moment in the air? You have your Bible with you today? We love the Word of God around here, amen? That book you're holding in your hand, that's the story of a divine drama. It started in the book of Genesis, and glory be to God, we all know how it's going to finish in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. But in this drama, as it unfolds, there are human beings, characters, men and women, young people that God touches and uses. And some of them, like Paul, take a lead role. They're famous. Their names are easily recognized. And then there are others. Men and women that seem to almost step on the stage of history for a moment and say their line, fill their role, do their part, and then they're gone. As a matter of fact, the man that we just read about, Ananias, is only mentioned once in Scripture, and it's in Acts chapter 9. We don't know hardly anything about his history or his past. We can surmise certain things from the Scripture, but very little. And we know nothing about what happens after this juncture. But this much we know. God used him in a mighty way. And the great temptation for all of us is we all have in our minds the kind of person we think God will use. We think God is looking for someone that's extremely gifted and talented. Someone that is very personable and charismatic. Someone that is a good public person. But could I point out to you that Ananias' great ministry was not done in public? As a matter of fact, best we can tell, nobody was there. His, his one recorded message and his only recorded miracle is done in secret in the privacy of a home where nobody was but he and Saul and the Holy Ghost of God. And yet, 2,000 years later, we're talking about him. You see, there are lots of supporting characters in the story. For example, later in the same chapter, there's another fellow by the name of Barnabas. You remember Barnabas, the encourager? Saul got saved, everybody's scared to death of him. Nobody wanted to accept him in the fellowship of the church. And the Bible says that Barnabas took Saul, brought him to him, brought him to the brethren and said, look, this man is really a Christian. God has changed his life. And through Barnabas' encouragement, Saul enters in to the fellowship of the believers. When you get to heaven, ask Paul what he thinks of people like Ananias and Barnabas. You see, while, while eyes are riveted on the blind man who met Christ on the road to Damascus, God is working in the heart of a man named Ananias to accomplish his purpose and his plan. I came this morning to tell you that God is doing something in this world and you're a part of it. I want all of you to take a deep breath, would you please? If you're still breathing... There's a reason for it. It's not by accident. It's not by chance. But if you got out of bed this morning and God let you live to see another day, then there is some reason why you're still here on this planet. There is some great plan. There is, there is some great story still being told. And you look, you may never be the Apostle Paul. You may be one of the supporting characters in this divine drama. But I'm going to tell you something. If you and I get to have any part in what God is doing in this world, that, my friends, is a work of grace and a glorious thing to be a part of. 
And here's a man that is not a, not a shining star. As a matter of fact, may I go so far as to say this? There are no stars in the work of God. The only star is the Lord Jesus Christ. All eyes are to be on him. All knees will bow to him. All tongues will confess to him. This is not about any one of us. It is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in a very real sense, I want to say to you today that all of us are just supporting characters in the divine drama. All of us are just the Lord's helpers along the way. And I want you to know when you leave this place today that God has designed it so that the most ordinary, average, what you might think just a normal Christian is, that person can be mightily blessed and used of God while they're living in this world. There are other men named Ananias. As a matter of fact, later in the book of Acts, there's a fellow by the name of Ananias who's a high priest. He's going to give Paul a hard time. Quite a contrast. There's another fellow by the name of Ananias. He was the husband of Sapphira. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Ghost. You want to talk about total opposites because this Ananias, this man that is only mentioned one time and is only remembered for this one incident was a man who understood that God was doing something and he was willing to work with the Holy Spirit to get in on what God was doing. All of my life I've read this story and imagined that Ananias was some old man that came decrepitly limping into the house of Judas there and ministered to Saul. But the truth of the matter is, you read it carefully and read the rest of the book of Acts, when Paul talks about him, we have no idea how old he is. I think that's a very good thing. You see, you never know at what season in life God is going to do his greatest work through you. There was a young man by the name of Evan Roberts that was used of the Lord mightily in his 20s in the great Welsh revival. God used him, but when that revival was over, Evan Roberts was hardly spoken of again. It was as if God led him onto the stage for that juncture to lead people to the Lord and then allowed him to go into obscurity. And there are men like Winston Churchill who by the very providence of God seem to have struggled all of their life and battled all of their life until they got to the end of it and then in the, in the last years of their life came to such prominence because God put them together for such a time as this. You see, it's not about how prominent a person you are. You may be less prominent, but you are not less purposeful because God's purpose is being accomplished in your life at this moment. As a matter of fact, you are in this service today on purpose. I don't know how you got here. You may come all the time. You may be invited by a friend. You may be like a lady that came through last week that said, I just drove by and saw the church and came in, or we've been watching on the Internet and came to this. I don't know how you got here. But I know this, there is a sovereign God in heaven that works all things according to the power of his own will. And God is at work in our lives so that he can accomplish his purpose in this world. What do we know about this man, Ananias? I'm going to give you three things in just a moment. But before I do, let me tell you one thing we, we know. He was not a religious leader. Best we can tell, there's no mention of him being a prophet or an apostle or an evangelist or a pastor or a deacon or a priest. As a matter of fact, if you study the house that Saul's sitting in, the house of Judas, most people believe he was a religious leader. Get this picture for a moment. Here is Saul sitting in a house, totally blinded, and the house he's sitting in is the house of a man who is a religious leader that supposedly knows God and knows the law of God, but God chooses not to use that man. Instead, God chooses a man, Ananias, and sends him all the way across town to a street called Straight, to the house of Judas, to minister to this man. And I want to say to you that while we would imagine and we would expect that God would use the pastor, or that God would use the Sunday school teacher, or that God would use the deacons. I want you to know, God wants to use every last one of us for the good of others and his glory in this world. So what is it that made Ananias a man that could be used of God? I'd like to give you three things, and I'd like you to write them down somewhere. Because what I'm about to give you is not the outline of a sermon. It's a prayer list. And I'd like to ask you to take these three things and begin to pray this week that these things would be true in your life. I'm praying them for myself. Here's the first one, number one. Ananias was found in the place where God put him. 
That may seem so silly, so insignificant, so, so commonplace. Ananias was living in Damascus. He was living where God placed him. See, most of us have the idea that the will of God is out yonder somewhere. The will of God is in some big task. The will of God is in some future thing. May I remind you that the will of God is not future. The will of God is always present. The will of God is not in some far off land. The will of God may be next door. But I say to you, it may be that God has given you the job you have because that is your Damascus. It may be that new neighbors moved in across the street from you because that is your Saul. You see, Ananias was not out on some great search, some, some great hunt for some big thing to do for God. No, Ananias was simply living the Christian life and as he did, God by divine appointment and providence used him in a mighty way. I would say this, he was not looking, he was being led. When I'm looking for things, sometimes I can interpret things wrongly. And I can create things for myself to do that really are not the will of God. But when I'm being led of the Holy Spirit of God, when God has control, when God is freely working in my life and I'm yielded to Him, then God puts things in order that only He can put in order. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Two things I want you to mark in your Bible about this particular thing. First of all, notice in verse number 10, the Bible says there was a certain, mark this word, disciple. I'll tell you, he was found in God's place. He was in God's place spiritually. He was where he needed to be so that God could use him. The only thing we know about this man is that he was a true follower of Jesus Christ. We're going to find out in just a moment. He was well versed in the law, which means probably he'd grown up in this Judaism and at some point in recent days because, look, Christ has not been risen too awfully long and, and the church hadn't been started too awfully long. But at some point in these opening years of the New Testament church, this man heard the gospel and trusted Jesus as his personal Savior. And by the way, that's where being a disciple must begin. You got to know for sure that your sins are forgiven, that heaven is your home and Christ lives within but it was more than that. This man was living a life of truly following Christ on a daily basis. Could I say this to you this morning? My only responsibility is to be ready. How many of you would say, before you die, you'd like God to use you in some definite way? Would you raise your hand? Look, I want that. I look at my children and I, I, think, I think of my own children. I think, Lord, please help me help them. Please help me teach them the right things. If I did nothing else with my life, I want my children to know and love Christ. I can't control all of that, but I want to do my part. I want God to use me to bring lost people to Christ. I mean, this world's filled with, with people that don't know Jesus, and I know him, and I want to lead others to the Lord, and I say, oh, God, please use me. Hear me, please. My first job is not to be used. My first job is to be usable. Because people that are usable are used. You know what my job is? To stay close to Christ, to keep my sins confessed, to keep my heart clean, to keep my motive right. And I'm going to tell you, that is a big job. And yet this was a man that was usable. As a matter of fact, let's let Paul testify about him. Hold your place here. Turn over to Acts chapter 22 with me for just a moment. This is the same story, but it's not the historical account. It is Paul's testimony about how he got saved. Oh, it's wonderful. Wish you had time to read the whole thing. But let's just jump right in the middle of it. Look at verse 11. Paul says this, Acts twenty two eleven. 11. When I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus and won Ananias. And here's what Paul knew about him. Number one, he was a devout man, according to the law. And here's the second thing. Having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour, I looked up upon him. Let's make it very simple. Would you look at verse 12? Here are the two things God wants if you're going to be used of him in this world. Number one, he wants you to be a devout man or a devout woman, devoted to Christ. 
sincere in your walk with the Lord. Could I probe for a moment? Is there anything right now between you and God? If there is, then that must be dealt with in order for God to get the glory. Look, the grace of God is to flow through us into the lives of other people, but it cannot flow where there are obstructions. William Tinley had it right. You've got to get to the place where you can say, nothing between my soul and the Savior, a devout man. And then a second thing, he had a good report of all. If you want God to use your life, number one, you've got to be right with God. And number two, you've got to work to have the kind of testimony and reputation that when others speak your name, they would not think your testimony for Jesus is a laughing stock. Someone should look at me and should look at you and say, I'll tell you one thing, that man's a real Christian. I can listen to what that woman says because I know she walks with God. I, I believe they really know the Lord. Look, if you want God to use you, you've got to be in the place where God can use you. You've got to be near enough to hear his voice in tune with heaven. You've got to be ready to see what it is God has created you for. Now go back with me to Acts chapter 9. I'll show you a second thing about being in God's place. Not only does it say that he was a disciple, the Bible says he was at Damascus. You may say, well, this is just a geography lesson. This has nothing to do with geography. This has everything to do with the providence of Almighty God. You see, I think this is fascinating, but God had his man in Damascus. Could I ask you something? Does God have his man in your subdivision? Does God have his man in your apartment complex? Does God have his man in your mobile home park? Does God have his man on your street? Does God have his man in your community in this city? See, here's what God delights to do. God just takes ordinary people and he scatters them everywhere. Oh, they are very ordinary, but they know God, and that's extraordinary. And God has made it so wherever he has placed you, that's the place of his choosing for you. Look, if you want God to use you, then be ready to obey him at every turn. Be in the place, wherever that is, that God can use you in a mighty way. And do not think that the will of God is some other thing or some other place or with some other person. No, the will of God is for you where you are at this moment in your life. God wants to use you to make a difference in this world. And you may never be famous like Saul would become. You may be that obscure Ananias, but I'll tell you, if you'll just be in the place that God has chosen for you, God can and will use your life. There's a second thing I want you to write down as a prayer request. Ananias, first of all, was in God's place. He was found in God's place. But secondly, Ananias was following God's promptings. If you want God to use you, you have to learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I've met a handful of people in my life that I thought were so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that when the Lord spoke, they were in tune. I think it's interesting that the only thing the Lord had to say to Ananias was his name. <laughs> Ananias, and immediately, behold, here I am, Lord. Sir, could the Holy Ghost speak your name today and you know who he's talking to? Ma'am, could, could you be so in tune with God that in the midst of a crowd of people, you could actually recognize when the Lord is dealing with you about something? See, that's what being a spiritual person is really all about. And part of our problem is we're so in tune with others and we're so in tune with ourselves and we're so in tune with this world that we're not in tune with God like we ought to be in tune with God. By the way, God knew that this man was in tune. Can I show you something interesting? God told Saul the name of the man that was going to show up at his house before he ever talked to the man. Before he ever showed up and said anything to Ananias, he had already told Saul, a man named Ananias is coming to your house. I'll tell you why. Because God knows our hearts. And God knew the minute he spoke to Ananias, Ananias' response was going to be, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do. And by the way, can I tell you this? Is there going to be fear involved in it? Will there be questions involved in it? Uncertainty involved in it? Absolutely. Here's a guy who says, Lord, they're killing people over there. Lord, do you know who you're sending me to? It's almost comical to ask the creator God of the heaven, do you know what you just said? But yes, he knows what he just said. 
Lord, that man is, is arresting people and you're sending me to him in the name of Jesus. That's the name he's persecuted and blasphemed. Are you sure? But in the end, this was a man who was open to God and obedient to God. He could hear the Lord. I think it's interesting that he says to the Lord, I have heard of many. I have heard of many about this man. And yet all the Lord had to do was speak to him once. And the Lord's one message to him about this man outweighed every message he had already heard about this man. Look, it doesn't matter what voices you've been tuned into, what others have said or what you have thought or what the devil's planted in your mind. When the Lord speaks to you, what is your response? Don't miss this. Would you mark this in your Bible? In verse number 10, he says, Behold, I am here, Lord. What does that mean? I want to tell you, that's not a statement of location. That's a statement of consecration. It's not because the Lord didn't know where he was. It's not that he was having to say, over here, Lord, I know you're looking for me. I'm over here. God already knew where he was. The Lord was there. Look, it wasn't this kind of I am here. It was this kind of I am here. It wasn't, Lord, here I am, look at me. It was, Lord, here I am, I'm yours. And whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. By the way, in this beautiful divine drama, that same statement keeps popping up over and over and over again. Look at this fellow over here. He's over 100. He's got a son now, a son that God promised him. He's pretty proud of him. He's grateful to God. He's excited about what the Lord's doing. His name's Abraham. Look at his son. Isn't he a good-looking boy? And one day he hears Abraham. What he's about to hear is going to stun him. It's going to devastate him for a moment. God's about to tell him, go sacrifice your own son. Now the Lord's not going to let that happen. We all know how the story turns out. But for a moment, Abraham was at a great crossroads in life. You know what his answer was? Here I am. And then there's Jacob living down at Laban's house. Things haven't turned out the way he hoped. Matter of fact, the family's messed up. All of his plans are messed up. Nothing's going right. And in the middle of the night, one night, God says, Jacob. You know what he said? Here I am. And then there's this fellow, Moses, watching sheep on the backside of the desert. And one day, enthralled with a bush that's burning, but not burnt up. Fascinating to watch. And suddenly, out of the bush, he hears, Moses. And his response, here I am. And then there's this fellow, Isaiah, that's seen a vision of the Lord high and lifted up. And God says to him, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. There's a little boy named Samuel laying in bed in the middle of the night hearing his name called and all he knows to say is here I am and finally he says speak Lord for thy servant heareth. Look please the story of the Bible is the story of people who were in tune with the voice of God and did what God prompted them to do. Now I don't mean to be spooky or fanatical or radical but I actually believe in a God that when you're walking down the street could prompt you to stop and talk to a human being and by divine appointment he has them seated on that park bench and you walking by at that particular time to get them the message of Jesus Christ. I believe in that. I believe in a God who allows even difficult things to take place and, and accidents supposedly to happen in his divine providence so that he can put people together and he can use one to turn another one to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if you want God to use you, you've got to be in God's place where he puts you and you've got to be following his divine promptings all the time. Drummond said it this way. I thought it was a powerful statement. God's servants work on short notices. And I'm going to tell you why we don't like that. Because we like to plan our whole life out. I won't know what I'm doing tomorrow and the next day and the next. And I got this calendar and I got this schedule and I'm going to get these things done. I got my agenda. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing for God to interrupt your agenda? 
What if the creator of the universe and the judge of all the earth decides to mess your day up tomorrow so in the middle of that he can use you to get him the greatest glory? Because supporting characters in the divine drama must follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But then there's a third thing, and to me this is the most amazing. Ananias, number one, was found in God's place. Number two, he was following God's promptings. But number three, Ananias was filled with God's love. This is strange. And I'm going to tell you this is something that only someone who truly knows Jesus can even, even begin to imagine. Because the man he's being sent to is a man that was hunting him. On the way to Damascus to arrest Christians and put them to death. Of whom Ananias was one. And yet notice the love of God through him. Look please at verse number 17. And Ananias went his way. By the way, when God says go thy way, he'll show you the way. Your your job, my job is just to obey it. Look at verse 17. Ananias went his way and entered into the house. Watch this. And putting his hands on him. Did you realize this man is a man whose hands have bound Christians and killed Christians? Did you realize that this man, this evil Saul, his hands have put to death children of God and everyone flees from those wicked hands? And yet when Ananias enters the room, he sees a blind sinner and he walks over to him and in tenderness and mercy and compassion, he puts his hands on him. I just want you to know that's not natural. I can look at pictures of little children starving somewhere and I can, I can well up inside with pity for them and want to help them and want to do them good. But let me just be frank. Show me the picture of some terrorist somewhere beheading those little children. I don't feel the same pity for him. No, there's a certain hatred almost that wells up inside. Excuse me. That's what Saul was. He was a terrorist. Wreaking havoc everywhere he went. Hold on to your seat. He lays his hands on him and he says to him, look at the first word out of his mouth in verse 17. What is it, church? Brother? Brother Saul? Sounds like the Lord Jesus standing in the garden of Gethsemane looking Judas the traitor in the face and calling him friend. How does that happen? Only the love of God. And he says to him, Brother Saul, you know what he literally said? He said, I believe that we have the same father now. And you're a member of my family. By the way, can I tell you this? Of all the titles that are ever given in a church, I think the most tender and wonderful titles are brother and sister. And some people may think it's corny and some people who are not accustomed to it may hear somebody say, we're going to ask brother so-and-so to come and pray or, or sister, we're praying for you. And somebody says, that's just kind of weird. Not if you're a member of the family of God, it's not. No, if you're a member of the family of God, you're just glad that we all have the same father. That we're brothers and sisters in the family of God. I'm going to tell you what does that. The love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. The love of God is what changed my heart and life. By the way, it wasn't just that God loved me. Listen, please. It was that God loved me through someone. It was a teacher that loved me and told me about Jesus and led me to Christ. It was parents that I watched and saw in them the love of God and wanted what they had. It's been a pastor who's modeled for me the love of the Lord for hurting people. It's changed my heart. It's people along the journey that I have seen in them something that was not of them. It was the love of God. Think of this. Ananias, you may think his part's small. I think it's big. I think we get to heaven. I want to shake Ananias' hand. This is the man that God chose to represent him to the Apostle Paul. Think of this. The first Christian, the first Christian Ananias, excuse me, Saul hears from after he meets Christ on the road to Damascus is a guy named Ananias. 
And the first man he sees when his eyes are open is this man, Ananias. Look, I think this is an honored fella in the pages of Scripture. Not because Ananias was something special, but because the love of God was real in him. May I pause and give you something just to chew on a little bit today. Do you realize what Ananias' first response to the Lord was? Lord, don't you know how bad a guy this is? Can I tell you the great tendency for all of us church-going people? We clean up good for Sunday school and we carry our Bibles and we sing our hymns. And by the way, thanks be unto God for the change He's made in us. Because there was a day none of us desired this. But if you're not careful, you'll spend all your time telling God how bad the sinners are. And God doesn't need you to tell Him how bad the sinners are. He knows it more than we do. What God is looking for is an Ananias that He can touch and use to demonstrate how good He is to those evil, wicked sinners. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 13 and we'll finish here. You want to be a man or a woman that God can use? Well, this is how it happens. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1. It may not look like what you think it's going to look like. It may not be the person you imagine it's going to be. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity. I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. So you want to be used of God? You don't have to be a good speaker. Because you can be a good speaker and not have the love of God, then it's nothing. You want to be used of God? Somebody says, well, I've studied the Bible a long time. I've got a lot of understanding. I've got a lot of Bible knowledge. I think I'm, I'm ready to be used of God. You, you can have a head full of knowledge, but if your heart isn't full of the love of God, God can't use you. You want to be used of God? Somebody says, well, i got faith. i got faith to believe great things and pray great things and see great things get done. That's great, but you can have the faith and without the love of God shining through your life, you will not be used to make a difference in the lives of others. Somebody says, yeah, but I give a lot and I, I sacrifice. I mean, we've really given up a lot for the Lord. Wait a minute, that's not going to make the difference. Could I remind you of our verse in Jude? It is compassion that makes a difference. It's the love of God. And I came today to tell you a very simple thing. And that is, you don't have to be the Apostle Paul. And everybody went, Shoo. I can't be the Apostle Paul. But you can be Ananias. You may not have the lead role that's in God's hands, what role you have. But my friend, you can be where God has placed you. You can follow divine promptings and be so full of the love of God that God can use you to make a difference in this world for Him.